the program manager, um, maybe the contracting officer representative, but they're the ones that actually understand or have the need. And they have the need to support the customer in the field. So it might just be a, like a home base kind of thing, maybe uh, <coughs> down the field. Contracting officer is the one that puts together the contract, and then the source selection authority is the person who puts together that evaluation criteria and source selection. Um, most agencies do use this format. Uh, the thing to keep in mind is that it, um, the entire con um, Uniform Commercial Code becomes the contract, except sections K, L, and M. So K is the representations and certifications. That's all the stuff that you do in what system? SAM. And so as long as your SAM system is current, um, that's fine, but it's not, those reps and certs, um, they're incorporated by reference into the contract, but section K is not L is your proposal instruction, so that's not incorporated into your contract, and M is not, M is the evaluation criteria. So those, those two administrative pieces of L and M are not included. Um, any, when you were going through, any questions about any of these particular areas when you looked at your own solicitations? Did your, the RFPs you looked at have any list of attachments? I saw discrepancies on, I don't know if it's... No, that never happens. That's your <laughs> issue. That's not what happens. <laughs> Between what? The, well, um, on the bed is on a site between the solicitation and then the attachments and material on the right hand side of the screen. Um, but it's been a while, I'm trying to remember what specifically. It was like not all the information was uh, on the right hand side of the screen. I'm dealing with it, I believe it may have, may have been a member. But is that, is that common to see your solicitation being in the, in the bottom price matrix, something like that, and then different information on the right? Um, so the, the requirement for the government is that they have to upload everything to that biz ops. And everything that you see on that home screen for that solicitation number is what you have to consider. So what will happen is the government will post the main solicitation and then any amendments or any contract forms that you need to complete. So they'll actually provide you templates for various things. Sometimes they have a read me first um, document so that they sort of guide you through how they've structured things. Um, but what I would do when you when you decide you're going to pursue a particular RFP, I would go to FedBizOps and pull down everything from the site and onto your hard drive because and I would just put it as version one, so that you know everything that happened as of that date, this was the current set of files. And then um, I would just get in the habit of check if it's an active procurement that you're going after, every day in the morning, just check it, and see if any amendments have been made. Because um, you, you want to be aware and be able to seize the moment of any amendments, and then just keep an ongoing updated file on your hard drive. Um, so that if, in case you ever have any issues, you can go back and figure out where the problem stem from. Um, so the government officials, they're trying to satisfy the customer in terms of cost, quality, and timeliness. So when we talk about the proposal development process today, you'll see that we'll be focused on cost, quality, and timeliness. Um, they're trying to minimize administrative operating costs, which means they normally want you to be the general contractor and bring in all the subs under you, so that they're just managing you. They want to conduct business with integrity, fairness, and openness. So, um, so the government cares about making sure they don't overtly give somebody an unfair advantage, but they're also concerned. I'll close it. They're also concerned about um, people not getting. Um, the perception that there's an unfair advantage. So you wouldn't see a contracting officer going off and having lunch with a contractor involved in an active solicitation, because that would give the perception of the issue. Um, and then to fulfill public policy directives, all the regulations that we talk about. Um, there's a big emphasis in the government right now to uh, shift from risk avoidance to risk management. So contractors can write a lovely story, right? <coughs> 
talk about how perfect they are in every way, right? And just list all the stuff. But the government knows that when you have contracts, there are going to be issues. And so what they're really concerned about is not that you're going to have a, um, that you're going to be able to avoid all risk, but that you have a, a management process in place to be able to accommodate that. How many people have taken project management classes before? Okay, cannot emphasize enough how much you need project management classes because project management um, gives you uh, ways to mitigate your own risks as contractors to the government. And it teaches you a series of tools that you can use to manage your business. And, um, you know, it, you could read uh, Kersner's, K-E-R-Z, N-E-R-S, uh, project management book. It's kind of like the standard handbook for project management. Um, Stephanie, I don't know if you have dollars available for a uh, project management class, but I'm telling you, it is just a useful skill set to have, just as you go through. We do offer a Lean Six Sigma Black Belt, okay. which very much incorporates and utilizes project management tools in every possible way, only more. Um, wouldn't you agree with that, Sam? Absolutely. Yeah. Over the top. Yeah, that's yeah. really, like, Six Sigma's way... Yeah, yeah, just even getting the basics down, uh, that's a huge commitment, you know yeah. what I'm saying? But yeah, so just think project manager. Think about taking it at a community, what community college did you say you were working with? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, you can take one over there, but those are just very useful classes to have. Um, and it, it also talks about how to mitigate strategies and being able to manage risks as opposed to thinking that you can avoid it. Because if you think you can avoid it, it's basically the ostrich in the sand, right? You can't, you can't avoid it. Um, you forecast requirements and develop long-range plans for um, accomplishing them. So that's what I was talking about before. The government doesn't think in terms of just this one procurement. You know, they have a whole mission to solve, and there's a lot of integrated pieces, and they've got to be able to handle that. Um, sometimes you're going to have to work with other companies. Uh, like your contract will have to work with another government contract to be able to meet the mission. So there's integrate. So not only do you have to figure out your own solution with your own vendors, there may be a requirement for you to integrate with other contracts, vehicles that they have out there. Um, you know, the government says that they encourage innovation and, and local adaptation, and what I find with that is that um, some agencies are better with it than others. Some are really all about innovation. Um, some of the leadership recently of GSA has been full steam ahead with innovation. Other agencies, not so much. Um, they try to communicate often and frequently with the um, commercial sector as early in the acquisition cycle as possible. And basically what they're trying to do is get out of their own headspace and into our headspace when it comes to these procurements so that they can procure things in a manner that you sell them. Uh, they want to foster cooperative relationships. I mean, I actually teach classes about the government industry partnership. That's they want classes like that to talk about how they can work better with industry. Um, so things like that happen, and then obviously we promote uh, transportation. I'm talking about cooperation. Um, we talk about first. Okay, so now what I want to do is talk a little bit about requirements. So. One of the things the government struggles with, and it goes back to the question you just raised, is that you know they put all these documents on people's ops and there may be disconnects between. First thing to keep in mind is that RFPs are written by a committee, right? We already talked about the program manager, source selection authority. There might be some users involved. They, they might bring, uh, what I'm noticing lately a lot of is they're bringing in consultants to write these uh, RFPs. And, you know, it's one thing if the consultant has been working with the agency for years and understands what their environment is, but a lot of times these consultants are being hired to come in and they don't know anything about the organization. So it's, uh, it's, it makes, those kinds of things make it frustrating for contractors. Do they hire, do they put out an RFP process to get the consultant to come in? That's wonderful. Well, I'll give you a case in point. So, Department of Labor, this was my first experience with it. It happened like within the last six months. The Department of Labor put out an RFP, which I didn't see, but it was for somebody to come in. You know, they have the um, work centers all around the world, or all around the country. And they, all those work centers right now are firm fixed price. And they want to change them to um, cost reimbursable. I'm sorry. They're cost reimbursable now, which means every hour the contractor works, they get paid for it. They want to change it to firm fixed price because they feel like the requirements are all steadfast now. 
So there was a company that won the contract. It was a small, disadvantaged business. And I'm, I swear to you, there's no indication to me that they can spell government, much less do anything else with them. And so um, they had already, the contract, it was supposed to be a four-month contract effort. And, you know, I got involved through a friend of a friend. Who, they were, like, desperate. And so um, they hired this other guy and I, and we came in. And I'm telling you, the government was about to terminate them for default. So I don't know, you know, sometimes it, Sometimes the government works across purposes with itself. So I think it's wonderful, and I'm obviously supportive of all of you and myself who are trying to get small business from the government. But sometimes they focus so much on this small business stuff that they forget about, like, do they really have the capability to do the work? Or the, the source selection part seems to be at this. So in this particular case, you know, had this other guy and I come in, not come in, and I'm not trying to bribe or anything, but like they would have lost the contract and it would have been under default. But I can't fathom that Department of Labor, this is their largest contract. This is the most significant thing that they get like congressional funding for and all this other kind of stuff, other than coming up with like labor standard rates. Um, this is huge for them. And the fact that they would give that to a small business, which I don't have any problem with if you're, if you're a small business that can do the work, but the fact that they're giving it to this company who literally was clueless, and, and how did they win it? Because the company gave them the lowest possible price that they could. And then what they were trying to do with consultants like myself was just to say, you know, do this for 20 cents, please, kind of thing. You know, and it was just, so, so like I said, they push for, for small business, but then you really need to make sure that the small business has the capability to be able to do the work. So um, requirements, that's a, uh, an A, and the longer it takes for the requirements to become right, uh, the more expensive it is. So just like any of us, when we have a tough project to do, you know, some of us may lean towards procrastination, or some of us may lean towards just working it, working it, working it, working it until we get it right. Obviously, the more we work it, the more expensive it becomes, um, but on the flip side, if the if the requirements aren't right, there's no way any of this else, nothing else is going to be right. So they have to get this right. But I would tell you, and I'm not criticizing the government, I teach in doctoral programs, and pe a lot of people cannot write. And so if you think about somebody who's made it to a doctoral program, in theory, that's a, I mean, that's a terminal degree, and they should have... Like, they were, they've reached the academic peak, and if they're not able to write, you know, tomorrow I'm going to talk to you about writing, <laughs> and I'm telling you, the government, you know, there's, there's a lot of issues with writing. And when there's issues with writing, that's why this requirements document gets screwed up. And that's why you're having problems finding things and disconnects and all this other kind of stuff. So, you know, I, not to say that you should become complacent, but just accept the fact that this is a, a big issue. Can we start using emoji cons? Emoji. Look out with a ruler and hammer. Okay, so we talked about the acquisition planning process, but it starts when the agency identifies a need for a supplier service, and the entire team should be developing the acquisition plan. So here's what happens, and I dare say you've had projects that you've worked on like this. Every, you know, the assignments get given out and everybody puts on their blinders and they're just working on their piece and, you know, I'm so busy with my piece because I've got my job to do and I've got to get this done too and I'm just focused on this that I really don't want to talk to anybody else because guess what? You're going to complicate my world. And that happens frequently in the government. And when that happens, you're seeing the disconnects. So not only is there a, um, some people have a poor, ability to communicate in the written form requirements. I mean, there are books written on how to write requirements. There are classes. I've taught classes in the government on how to write requirements. So there's, there's that problem, but there's also, I'm working in a silo, and I don't know what all of you are doing, and you don't know what I'm doing, so therefore there's disconnects across the, the groups. I'm not trying to be pessimistic. I just want to set the stage for you. So if you see issues like that, don't think it's you. Like, don't think, oh, I'm brand new to federal contract, and this must be a me issue. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Write a question and submit it to the government. And 
they'll go, because if you have a question, other uh, companies have the same question. Um, so the entire team should develop that acquisition plan and, and the RFP, so their technical people should identify potential risks, their finance people should uh, handle any kind of budgeting and funding, their contracting personnel have to provide all the input into source selection and consideration, the procurement team can provide potential sources, uh, their customers have to get involved to tell them what they really need. Because sometimes what happens, I'm sure you've never seen this happen, headquarters comes up with a wonderful plan that has absolutely no bearing on what happens in the reality of the field, right? And when that happens, you end up with a system that's totally not helpful to anybody. That's cost a lot of money uh, in the process. And then um, contractors, we're also part of this because they need to be looking at what our products and services are to be part of this team. So think about all these different people that are involved. But typically the technical people just I don't, you know, they're in their own home without looking at any of this other stuff and sort of these other people. Uh, this is that visibility, this is the uh, iceberg underneath. Uh, so what you're actually going to see in your RFP document is just that tip of the iceberg. You're not going to know all this other stuff that pushes that out. That's why I suggested doing your homework and really understanding who your customers are. Um, they also have to make sure they're fair to everybody. Um, and, and a lot of people don't know this, but they're actually on schedule to get these procurements out the door. So you might have a contracting officer that has maybe mm, 50 different procurements that they're responsible for. Now they have contract specialists that work for them that do all the legwork, and they're on quotas to get so many things done. And, and they get very frustrated because if they're in class, they're not working on the stuff. Their buildings may shut down at five o'clock. You know, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, issues about actually being able to meet these uh, procurement milestones. So they've got that going on. We talked about perceptions, we talked about drafter of the contract and misconceptions. Those are the clusters by those we talked about. Okay, so remember we had the conversation about thou shalt and, you know, have all the thou shalt do this, thou shalt do this. So when the requirements are written this way, the government is considered the drafter of the contract, and if there's any errors or omissions, it's the government's fault. Um, in the case of a statement of work, um, or a performance work statement, the government just sets standards. Remember we talked about you know, 60 lumens, and the contractor describes how. So in this case, it's almost like a true-false test, right? The government says this requirement, we say yes or no, we're going to meet it. The government says this requirement, we say yes or no, we're going to meet it. Over here, it's more like an essay exam. The government sets, sets the standard, and then you have a blank page to figure out what your solution is. And if a government agency is really sharp, meaning they have the right technical resources evaluating this proposal, they should look at your essay, just like any professor does, and say, knows exactly what they're talking about, or is trying to BS me. Right? And, and that should be part of this evaluation as to whether the government feels comfortable with your capabilities. Uh, so we talked about those. Okay. Um, so these are all means to an end. So in this first case, when, um, when the government issued the statement of work, that makes it all the government issue. When um, there's a PWS where the government says they're using a performance work statement, but they still make it sound very requirement oriented, it's still the government issue. It's not until we get into this uh, statement of objectives as issued by the government and then we write back our work statement and it comes from us and it's part of the evaluation, that's when we have true government industry collaboration. And the reason why I'm emphasizing this again is because when we talk about the proposal sections, one of the things that's required is a QAS, Quality Assurance Surveillance Plan. So, um, in the old days, what would happen is the government says, we care about quality, and the industry would say, we care about quality, and the government would have a few conferences every year, and um, this year they would be talking about Deming's total quality management circles. And next week they would be talking, or next year they'd be talking about uh, quality management, and the following year, quality metrics. Like every year it was like a new buzzword. And, Pretty much the way it went down was industry would go to those conferences, figure out what the latest buzzwords were, sprinkle those buzzwords throughout our proposal, 
we would submit the proposal, the government would say, oh look, they're using all the right buzzwords, check, and um, award the contract to us, and then we wouldn't pay any attention.